is I've heard about our, some of the families, our extended families who are multiplying here in our churches. More and more grandkids are coming into the family. You know, you hear somebody's expecting a baby. And as you get these birth announcements or sometimes the gender reveal parties and their cupcakes or balloons or whatever it is that people do, a lot of times there's a great deal of excitement surrounding that. And so you hear and you've seen, you know, videos of people that they just, they freak out, they scream, they celebrate as, you know, they hear that a new baby is coming. But every once in a while, you'll see some that don't respond that way. Uh, we enjoy watching Funny Tone videos, and you'll sometimes see where there's a birth announcement, and a bunch of people are excited, but then there's this one young one that's upset because, lo and behold, I wanted a sister, not a brother. Or I wanted a brother and not a sister. Or mom is going to have a baby, and that's great until you realize that you've got to share your room with them, and suddenly you're not so happy about it. Typically, a birth announcement brings a lot of joy, but every once in a while, you find somebody that's a bit persnickety and out of sorts because of that. People respond differently to the news. This morning, we're going to be in the story of the wise men. You can begin turning there. Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And in Matthew chapter 2, we have the wise men or the magi who come. And what we're going to find out as we go through the story is that there are varying reactions to news of this newborn king. And as we see that, what we're going to notice is maybe some interesting parallels to the way that people react to news about Jesus today, not just back when he was born. And so I'm hoping that will be instructive for us. So if you are in Matthew chapter 2, you can follow along. We're going to start and actually just read through the entirety of this portion about the Magi, starting in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time that the star appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way. And the star which they had seen in the east when it went on, before, uh, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream, by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, we're going to see these different reactions from these different people to the same announcement. One announcement, three different re uh, reactions. And the first reaction we see comes from the potentate. Now, that's not a term that we use, but it kind of works out parallel-wise here, and you'll maybe see why in a little bit, but a potentate. Now, a potentate is what we would call a dictator, strong man. This is a person who is a, an autocrat, somebody who is in charge, and there's not much question about their power, and you don't really have a right to tell them to do otherwise. It's a person with incredible authority, and a person who exercises that authority, often in a selfish or capricious way. So this potentate, King Herod, now he is just mentioned in the passage because the first century readers would have been very familiar with him. You didn't have to build a lot of background. But for us, we're not as familiar, so let's fill in the blanks a little bit about who this Herod guy was. Herod ruled from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. Okay, that's one of the reasons why we know Jesus wasn't actually born at like 0 A.D. because of the fact that Herod was around and he died in 4 B.C. So sometime um, in, later in his reign is when Jesus was born. Now, he was called the king of the Jews, but he was not actually Jewish. He was a descendant of Esau. He was Idumean. It's a region around there. And he was appointed to lead the Jewish nation, but he was appointed by Rome. So he was a lesser king underneath Rome, okay, underneath the emperor of Rome, to rule over the, the land of the Jews and some other uh, territories surrounding there. He was a very effective leader early on. He did a lot of building campaigns, including building the temple in Jerusalem, a port at Caesarea. He built lots of fortresses. Um, he was one who put down rebellions. He was very effective in his leadership. But later in his life, he became very paranoid about people trying to take the throne from him. 
Now, he was a person that um, had a lot of wives, 10 of them, uh, if, if I understand correctly, 10 of them. And even his favorite wife, he had given instructions that said, if something happens to me when I'm out you know, traveling around, you guys, uh, the soldiers are to kill her. Now, she, um, he actually had his favorite wife's parents killed. Not exactly sure why that happened, but she didn't take too kindly to that. So he had her killed along with two of her sons, who he thought were going to be vying for the throne. He was one that did not like any sort of threat to his leadership. And so he had a reputation for being a person that was a little bit unstable, you could say. And so it makes sense that when it says, when he hears of a new king, where's he who's been born king of the Jews? Uh, my title, I'm on my business card, says king of the Jews. There's a new king? Oh, really? You can understand why it was not only he was disturbed, but so was all of Jerusalem with him. What's this guy going to do when he realizes there's a threat to his leadership? So there's a reaction from people who are a potentate or who are a dictator kind of person. When a person is an autocrat and they're in charge, there is antagonism when there is a threat to their throne. They do not want anybody coming against them and they will fight against any force, any person who is going to challenge their authority. So a newborn king, them's fighting words. Now, interestingly, present day, there are a lot of autocrats. Now, when I mention an autocrat or a potentate, you probably have certain people that come to mind. You're thinking like North Korea or Russia or China. But the fact is, if we look around, we are surrounded by autocrats. An autocrat is the one who says, I'm in charge and nobody's going to tell me what to do. Do you know some people like that? We're surrounded by them all the time. God, you're not going to tell me what to do. Somebody else, you're not going to tell me what to do. I am master of my own destiny. Thank you very much. And you guys can just back off. We are surrounded by those. So when the gospel of God's kingdom comes and says, there's a new king, there's a new person who's in charge, an autocrat's thinking, uh-uh, you don't touch my money. You don't tell me what to do with my time. You know, this is my body. I will do with it what I like. Thank you very much. Even my own identity. I will set my own identity. You know, it doesn't matter what my body says or how I was born or what I look like. I'm going to make my own identity, even to the point of saying, it's like, I might be male, but I'm going to be female. You know, people will say, I reject authority. I am going to do what I want go where I want, spend what I want, sleep with who I want, I'm going to do it. I am an autocrat. They don't take kindly to a challenge saying that there is another king. Now, with each of these people that we're going to look at, starting with Herod, we're going to see there's two ways that we could possibly apply this. Now, the first is to say, am I living as an autocrat? Do I view myself that way? The news of a newborn king, how does that uh, um, set with me? Now, not necessarily a newborn king now because Jesus has already come. But when somebody announces there's a king who says they are in charge of your life, do you feel a rebellion inside of you? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, the, the re right response is recognize he is the king and there's nothing you can do about it. So what you need to do is you need to submit and say, God, you are in charge. Jesus is the king and I'm going to submit to his leadership. Jesus in the Bible has, you know, people call him Jesus, the, the Christ, the Messiah, Savior, but he is also Lord, meaning he's the sovereign ruler. He's the one who's in charge. And so we need to submit and say, God, if, if Jesus says it, I need to do it. I need to submit to him. That's the first response. But I know a lot of you have already made that commitment. I am submitted to Jesus. He is Lord of my life. So I want you to look at this from another perspective as well. Not so much from being an autocrat or a potentate, somebody who's in charge, but from one who is announcing the news about Jesus to such a person. Because that's where we find ourselves sometimes. That we are saying, you know what? There is a God in heaven. There is a, a Lord that we need to submit to. And there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to like it when we say that. And we have to be ready for that reaction and that response. No, thank you. I don't want to hear that. And they might not just kind of attack God verbally, they might attack you as well, attack your reputation. They might even attack you physically if you're trying to share with them about Jesus. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for a long time. And we're going to find with each of these points, there's some instructions that Peter gives in his two letters, first and second Peter, that are going to um, help to tell us how do you respond in this kind of situation. All right. So if you are a person who is trying to proclaim the king, to other people and they don't want to receive it, 
Peter tells us how we are to respond to that. So look at 2 Peter, and we're going to look at verse three through, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Know this, first of all, Christians, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it has from the beginning of creation. Oh, you talk about God. I don't see him. You say Jesus is coming back. Um, hadn't happened yet. I'm going to do my own thing. And they're going to heap abuse on you because of it. Now, back in 1 Peter, he talks a little bit more about how we're to um, respond to this. See, in 2 Peter, we talked about how we need to realize that mockers will come, but we need to be ready. Be ready for them. 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keeping a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. We need to be ready to respond when people say, why are you different? Why do you submit to that king? You say, here's why. Be ready to respond rightly, respond gently, but clearly. And so being ready means that we don't just respond in the moment, we plan ahead of time. How are we going to respond when that happens? So we realize that we be ready, but we also need to rejoice. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 16. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory, that's when Jesus comes back, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So we need to remember that it's going to happen. We are going to face antagonists. Be prepared, be kind, be clear, and then keep on telling them about the king. Now that's the first group um, that we see, or it's the first person we see in this Matthew story, is that potentate and how he responds with antagonism. But the second group is probably the more prevalent that we're going to run into. It's not those that are openly antagonistic. And these people are represented by the priests. By the priests. Now, it's interesting that Herod, um, well, it's not interesting that Herod called the priests because he was not an expert in Jewish law. Okay, where's this Messiah to be born? He had some familiarity with it. But he called in the experts, the, the teachers of the law, like the scribes, they were experts, and then the religious leaders. And he said, where is he to be born? Because he was asking the experts. But what is interesting is that the experts drop out of the story as soon as they talk to Herod. You would think that Jewish people who knew that a Messiah had been promised, when they hear that a Messiah has come, they're probably going to be hightailing it to Bethlehem because they want to see what's going on. Now, we're not told specifically that Herod told them that, but I'm guessing with the, this group of magi coming into town and Herod asking this question, they could probably put two and two together. But you don't see them with any sort of passion. You see them just kind of taking it in stride. Now, Jewish rejection of Jesus is a theme all through the Gospels. And you see it starting right here in Matthew that Jesus came to reach out to the Jews, but they rejected him. And that's when the mission goes out uh, to the Gentiles. There's this... this um, resistance. They have a heart problem. So in Matthew chapter 15, we're going to try and diagnose why it is that these religious leaders, these priests, why didn't they respond by going to see Jesus? It's because of their heart condition. Matthew 15 uh, verses 8 and 9. This people honors me with their lips, Jesus is saying, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. They say all the right things. They dress the right way. They go to the right places. But on the inside, their heart is far away. Christmas time is typically a time when more people are going to come into the church. Easter, people come into the church. Sometimes people are here every single Sunday, but that does not guarantee that there's any sort of difference in their hearts. They do the right things. They say the right things. They might even know the scriptures really well, but where's their heart in relationship? And I can see, even as I'm talking, that some of you know and feel the pain of that because you know people in your life that is that way. All the right stuff on the outside, 
but nothing on the inside. Now, what could lead them to do this? Well, with the priests, there's a couple of temptations. One is they've got the perks of their position. In Matthew 23, uh, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says this about the religious leaders. They love the places of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. They like all the perks of their position. They like all the, the benefits that come along with it, the respect that it earns them. But that can also, um, well, that can turn you away from God um, in a, at a heart level because of the fact that there's so many pleasures with just the position. But they also had political pressure that was coming too. Now, this one comes from the book of John. In John chapter 11, the uh, religious leaders have gotten together and they're having a meeting because things are kind of getting out of hand and Jesus is very popular. So John 11, 47 to 48. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They're afraid of the political repercussions because Rome realized that the religious leaders had influence with the people. If we can get a hold of the religious leaders, if we can manipulate them, then we can control the people. We can keep uprisings from happening, keep everything peaceful with the Jews. Rome stays in charge. Everybody's happy. Keeping what you've got, whether it be the perks of position, political place that you are, keeping what you have um, by minimizing disruptions. If they can just keep things from being disrupted, keep the status quo, everything will be nice. Well, the thing is, is when a new king shows up, it disrupts the status quo. It shakes things up. My life might have been going along, along just fine until there's news that somebody's coming in and telling me what to do. There's a new king. It's going to unsettle things for me. We need to guard against this kind of apathy. The apathy that comes from comfortable Christianity. Guard against that. We are not called to be comfortable. God is the one that gives us comfort, but he does not call us to a comfortable life in this life. That's, that's coming down the road. Right now, we need to be unsettled, continually looking for how to advance God's kingdom. Now, Peter addresses this as well. First Peter, in uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Okay, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it says if these qualities are yours and are increasing, what qualities? We need to back up and see what those are, but see what the danger is. You can be useless and unfruitful as a follower of Christ. It doesn't say that you're not a Christian. It doesn't say that you're not saved. It is possible that you have that knowledge. You know who Jesus is, and you're not doing a thing with it. You're not productive for the kingdom. You're just, like as an employee, you're just taking your salary but not accomplishing anything. So what qualities is it that we need that are going to be increasing that are going to uh, help us to be fruitful. Okay, let's go to the next slide, back up to verse five. Okay, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, uh, knowledge. Okay, next slide. And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing you will not be unfruitful. It doesn't just say that you have these qualities. It says that they are increasing. Some of you may have been whitewater rafting before. I was able to do that when I was uh, about 14 years old. And so we had our instructor who uh, told us how to do this. My dad, my brother, and I went whitewater rafting out in Colorado. And so they tell you instructions about how it is that you need to paddle. You need to listen to the person that is your guide on the river. Because you're going down a river with a lot of current. You know, it's got its own rapids and little waterfalls and things like this. There's rocks, there's logs, there's obstructions. There's things that will flip you over and will drown you if you are not careful. And so what you need to do is you need to be continually paddling. You do not coast on the river. Sometimes he's telling you to back paddle. Sometimes he's telling this side to paddle forward, this side to paddle backwards. Sometimes he's telling you both paddle, paddle with all you've got because we've got to you know, pick up some speed. The thing is, is he doesn't tell you don't do anything because if you don't do anything, you drift. 
And if you drift, you are at the mercy of the river. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, paddle with all you've got. Listen, you've got to be working and growing. If you stop growing as a Christian, you start dying. Keep growing. Keep growing in your godliness, in your knowledge, in your perseverance, in your love. That's how we keep uh, from drifting. And that's how we keep away from apathy. Now, ironically, the group that shows the best reaction to Jesus is the one who knows the least about him. And this is the pagans. This is the pagans. Now, Herod probably had some knowledge about the Messiah. The priests would have known an awful lot about the Messiah, having probably memorized large portions of what we call the Old Testament. These pagan guys, not so much most likely. Um, now, we think of magi and we call them wise men. Well, what exactly does that mean? Okay, are they this, this smart? When I was a, a kid, I used to think of a doctor as being the person in the white lab coat with the stethoscope and you go and, you know, they put that thing on you and they treat you when you're sick. Okay, that's what a doctor is. Well, that is a kind of doctor, but there's all kinds of other doctors. As I got a little bit older, I realized doctor actually means somebody that's just gone through a whole lot of education and testing and has achieved a certain level. So if you are, you can have a, a doctor of medicine, which is the kind I was familiar with, but you can also have a doctor of philosophy or a doctor of economics or a doctor of theology or religion or whatever. It's a certain level of achievement. Think of these guys as being doctors, okay? They got a whole bunch of letters after their name. Now, the Magi were specialists in knowledge, knowledge of the skies. They would watch the stars and, and could track those. They had knowledge of uh, religious texts and ancient texts. And they would put those things together to try and help interpret the events that were happening politically around the world. And so if a comet came, that was the sign that a, um, that a ruler was going to come down. Somebody was going to die. And so actually there was even a, a Roman ruler one time when a certain heavenly phenomenon happened, he realized, oh my goodness, that portends that a, that a ruler is going to die. So he killed a bunch of other people so it could possibly apply to them instead of to him. And so they, rulers would look for um, signs in the heaven and stuff, and they, they depended on the magi, these wise men, to interpret the events for them. You guys know what the texts say. You know what the stars are doing. So think of these guys as having like a triple doctorate in political science, astronomy, and ancient literature and religion. Probably all thrown together. And so they would interpret this stuff. Chances are these guys might have even been an official delegation. Now it says they're from the east. Uh, Arabia, Persia, Babylon, we're not really sure. But those areas had Jewish populations. Remember, the Jews were exiled to Babylon. Not all of them came back to the Holy Land. So there was still a lot of them there. And so these guys would probably have studied some of the, um, the Jewish sacred texts, would be familiar with the Jewish community. And now how is it that they knew? We don't know. How is it that they saw a star and interpreted it? We're not exactly sure. Now, there is a text in the Old Testament in um, Numbers 24, 17. And it says uh, this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob and a scepter shall rise from Israel. This seems predictive of a ruler who is going to rise. And it uses the term star. So maybe they thought that. We're not really sure. But all through um, the Old Testament, well, I told you about it in the Gospels, it talks about the Jews rejecting Jesus. But all through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, it talks about how God's heart is not just for the Jewish people. God's heart is for all the nations. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 12, verse 3. This is God's promise to Abraham. And he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families, all the peoples of the earth are going to be blessed in Abraham. Now, we know that this is because Abraham was the great, 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 and so many grandfather of Jesus. It is through Jesus that all those people are going to be blessed. Mark 11, just to give you one thing from the Gospels and then one other from the New Testament. Mark chapter 11 and uh, verse 17. He began, this is Jesus, to teach and to say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Nations is where we get our word ethnicity from. 
all ethnic groups. He didn't come from just the Jews. He came for the Arabs, for the Chinese, for the Indians, for the Caucasian, for the African. He came for all the nations. And one of the ones I love the most, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, gives you a picture of a worship service in heaven. Look at this. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands. This is a multi-ethnic worship service. There are going to be people from every ethnic group in heaven. So when you are in heaven and you are worshiping the Lord, you're going to be looking right and left and you're going to see people that don't look like you. They are going to be different and God loves them just as much and wants them to be a part of his kingdom. God did something to draw these magi. Sacred texts, stars, conversation, we don't know, but God uses every means to draw people to him. For what purpose? What happened in Revelation? They were worshiping. This was for adoration. They are going to adore God. God created all the peoples, and God says, all those peoples are going to praise me. It doesn't mean every individual, but it means representative from every group of individuals on earth is going to be praising God in adoration. Now, biblical examples of how God does this. God is about gaining glory for himself. I'm going to run through real quick. Exodus from Egypt, all the plagues and everything, that gave a reputation in Egypt and all around the Middle East, even decades and I think even hundreds of years later, it was, people were saying, isn't this the people whose God did all those things to Egypt? God was glorifying himself through bringing his people out of Egypt. When God brought um, them into uh, the promised land and they settled, God said, I'm going to bless you so that other people will come and say, wow, your God must really love you. And it would give them a chance to witness because of the blessing that they were receiving. During the exile, after God's people had been disobedient, they were sent off to Babylon. But people like Esther, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they testified before kings and rulers of who God was. God was wanting to to reach out to those pagan nations through his people. At Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes down. This group of 120 people start preaching in all the languages of this multi-ethnic group that was together at Pentecost because he wanted to reach the nations. And then throughout the book of Acts, as the church goes forth, sometimes because of persecution, sometimes because God moves them and calls them, they go out as missionaries all over the Mediterranean basin to spread the gospel and to start churches and to reach all these different ethnic groups. God's desire is for all. He uses all means and all areas of knowledge to draw all kinds of men. Now, remember with these points, we talked about how each one of them applies to us maybe in two different ways. One, if you are far from God, God is drawing you. You are a part of those groups of people that God is drawing to himself. Will you respond? Will you come? These guys made a really long journey to go find Jesus. You don't have to. You just have to turn and look and surrender. So are you responding to him? But also, do you realize that he is using you to draw others? Jesus is coming back again. He came one time, but he is coming again. They saw his star and realized something, the, the king has come. We know from the scriptures, the king has come and the king is coming and he is sending you to announce it to other people and to tell them about it. Now, because of the truth that Jesus is coming back and because of what is going to happen associated with this, because the, the world's going to get burned up and remade and, and all that, it's talked about in the scriptures in several places. But again, in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 14 since all these things are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless." Three times in those verses, it says, looking for. You're looking for things to be destroyed in this way. You're looking for a new heavens and new earth. You are looking for Jesus to come back. 
since we are looking for him to come back, what are the things we need to do? Just going to narrow it down to two. You ready yourself and you reach others. You ready yourself. It says holy living, godly conduct, blamelessness, spotlessness. We need to look at our lives and just like a bride who is preparing for her wedding day, what does she want to do? She wants to look the best that she possibly can. You know, diet, exercise, skin treatments, you know, do her hair, all this kind of stuff. She beautifies herself for her groom that she is going to see. We are the bride of Christ. We beautify ourselves in preparation for him coming. And how do we do that? By living a godly, holy life before him. That's how we show him we love him, is by preparing and beautifying ourselves. So that's the first thing. Ready yourselves, but we also work to reach others. Did you notice there in verse 12, uh, excuse me, was it verse 12? Um, it says where you look forward to the day of God and you speed his coming. Did you know that you can have an effect on when Jesus comes back? You can. You look forward to the day of God and you speed his coming. How is that possible? How can you have an effect on when Jesus comes back? Well, remember what happened in Revelation 7, 9. This multi-ethnic community in heaven praising God. Well, doesn't it stand to reason if people from every tongue, tribe, nation, language, people group are going to be in heaven, that people from every tongue, tribe, nation, language all have to hear about Jesus? Okay, I'm going to give you two more verses. Matthew 24, 14. I'm just going to quote it from memory. It may be a little different than what's on the screen. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. Jesus is explaining to his followers, this is what's going to happen when I come back. This is how the end is going to happen. The gospel is going to be preached to all nations, all ethnic groups, people groups, before the end is going to come. And then what does he say in uh, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Go and make disciples of whom? All nations, all ethnic groups. You can have an effect on when Jesus comes back. You can speed it along by telling as many people as possible and announcing the good news, the king has come. The king is here. So let me close with two questions. Jesus has come. What's your response? Are you going to surrender to him? You're going to surrender to the king? And are you going to rejoice in the king? You're going to have that adoration. Jesus, you have come. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to surrender to you. But also the fact we live between the two comings of Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Are you readying yourself? And are you reaching out to others? Those are our marching orders. Be the people God wants us to be. And let's grow the people of God by reaching as many as possible. So as we have this closing song, this is a Christmas song, but this is an evangelism song. This is a missionary song here as we are told to go forth. So take this as a time of surrender, and a time of commitment, and a time of basically saying, sign me up, God. I want to be yours to go and to tell others about you. And then I'll close this in prayer after we're done. Go tell it on the map.